Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, the top 10 real-life Frankensteins from the annals of medical history. Italian surgeon Sergio Canvero made headlines recently for claiming he has the ability right now to transplant a live human head onto a corpse and successfully reanimate both. Of course, experts dismiss him as a quack, giving a TED talk doesn't necessarily make you reliable, but few seriously doubt that what he says is theoretically possible. Whether or not Canavero gets there first will almost certainly be able to do it one day, and when that day comes will definitely go ahead and will do it. This is because regardless of the controversy and ethical concern that inevitably surrounds such a procedure, human head transplantation would be the latest development in a long history of grisly Frankensteinian but nevertheless life-saving science. From the golden age of alchemy to some of the more bizarre and mix-and-match transplants of late, here are some of the highlights. Number 10. Abu Musa Habir ibn Hayyan (721–815). Abu Musa Habir ibn Hayyan, or Geber as he became known in Europe, is one of history's most notable alchemists, having written dozens of treatises on the subject, including the seminal Kitab al kima from which we derived the word alchemy itself. He also laid the foundation for the periodic table and introduced basic equipment processes such as crystallization and distillation, and terminology such as alkali that are still used by chemists today. Some historians actually credit Habir ibn Hayyan with the founding of modern chemistry, having transformed the mystical, largely theoretical focus of alchemy with his own more practical, experiments-based approach. Still, many associate his name with the so-called Taquin, a homunculus-type creature that he claimed could be made in a lab. This was a common belief in the Middle Ages that artificial life might be possible, but Habir ibn Hayyan actually gave instructions. To give life to a Taquin, he wrote, one must combine blood, semen, and various body parts in a glass vessel shaped like the creature that you wanted to make. It's unclear, but let's face it, doubtful that he ever successfully made one. However, given his strong emphasis on empirical science, it's also hard to believe that he would have just made it all up. Unless, of course, as he implied himself in the Book of Stones, the purpose was to baffle and lead into error mad scientists who were more sinful than he. Number 6. Johann Dippel from 1673 to 1734 Born at Frankenstein Castle, south of Darmstadt, southern Germany, Johann Dippel's childhood education was deeply religious, led for the most part by his own past father. By the age of nine, however, he began to express his doubts about the church, and by the age of 14, he was accused of keeping the company of familiar spirits or demonic helpers. Although he went on to study theology, he was continually questioning the church and changing his position, ultimately turning his attention to science and alchemy instead. He dabbled in transmuting base metals into gold, for instance, and distilling animal parts for medicinal oils, the most notable of which was the black, foul-smelling Dipples animal oil made from leather, blood, and ivory, and marketed as an elixir of life. He also claimed that the oil could be used to exorcise demons, which he mentioned in his work alongside transferring souls between corpses using a funnel. Dipple's animal oil enjoyed only brief and modest popularity as a diaphoretic or sweat inducer, perhaps understandably, and antispasmodic. Despite Dipple's claims that it was capable of curing pretty much anything, including death, it fell out of favor before too long. The fact that Dipple himself died early, having predicted he'd live to 135, certainly did not help. The fetid black oil did make a comeback during the Second World War, though. It was used to coat the insides of enemies' wells and make the water undrinkable. Number 8. Luigi Galvani from 1737 to 1798 Many real-life Frankensteins, as well as Mary Shelley herself, were inspired, you might even say, galvanized by the work of Luigi Galvani, the electrophysiologist who came up with the concept of galvanism and the use of electricity to stimulate life. Back when Galvani was conducting his experiments in the second half of the 18th century, electricity was still a fairly new and exciting development. Most scientists barely understood it, but Galvani saw in it great potential for the advancement of 
medical science. In 1786, having made a dead frog twitch merely by touching its nerves with scissors during a lightning storm, he theorized that animals produce electricity of their own. He tested and confirmed his suspicions on countless other frogs and suggested this animal electricity was secreted as a kind of electrified substance from the brain. Although his work was contentious at the time, it did lead one of his most vocal critics, Alessandro Volta, to invent the voltaic pile, an early electrical battery. Unfortunately, when Galvani refused to swear allegiance to Napoleon, he lost his professorship and salary and died a little while later, right on the cusp of the electrical revolution that he helped bring about. Number 7. Giovanni Aldini, 1762-1834 Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, was fascinated by his uncle's experiments and he was eager to carry the torch. But not by experimenting on frogs. Indeed, Aldini had his sights set on larger animals like cows and pigs, whose cold, dead bodies, tongues and eyeballs he caused to shake and move by applying electrical current. Later, perhaps inevitably, he turned his attention to humans using a massive voltaic pile with hundreds of metal discs to apply electrical electricity to headless corpses. As Frankensteinian as all that sounds, none of it took place in a ruined gothic castle in the middle of a violent thunderstorm. In fact, Aldini performed most of his gruesome experiments in broad daylight before a horrified crowd. Although he was able to produce some of the same contractions and twitches that he'd already seen in animals, he was disappointed to find that hearts didn't seem to respond. There was also a mere three-hour window after death in which any effects could be observed. Deciding he needed a corpse that hadn't lost so much blood, Aldini traveled to London in search of a hanged, not decapitated criminal. It didn't take long to find his test subject, the corpse of a man named George Foster, to which he immediately set about applying electricity. According to Aldini's report, the jaw began to quiver, the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted, and his left eye actually opened. When he stimulated the rectum with his rods, the whole body convulsed so much as to give the appearance of reanimation. Eventually, however, the battery died, and Foster along with it, for the second time that day. But the interest and awe that Aldini evoked, both within the scientific community and the public at large, almost certainly inspired Mary Shelley. And Aldini, who is said to have shared some of Victor Frankenstein's mannerisms was actually alive for the book's publication. Number 6. Andrew Err from 1778 to 1857 a professor of chemistry and natural philosophy at Glasgow in Scotland, following a stint as an army surgeon, Andrew Err was eager to further the work of his groundbreaking Italian peers. So he jumped at the chance to experiment on the corpse of one Matthew Clydesdale, the first person to be publicly hanged in the city for many years. Right after the execution, the man's body was spared by horse and cart to the university's anatomy theater, where the good doctor was patiently waiting with his battery already charged. He made no secret of his intentions. He wanted to resurrect the dead. And according to an alleged eyewitness report, the experiment was such a success that Err was forced to slit Clydesdale's throat with a scalpel to make sure that he was dead for good. That probably didn't happen, of course, but the established facts are just as grisly. First, the corpse was sliced open to reveal the sites for stimulation. Then Err attached electrical rods to the heel and spinal cord, causing Clydesdale's bent leg to straighten and kick out, almost toppling one of Err's assistants. They also applied electricity to the left phrenic nerve and the diaphragm and were delighted to see that the corpse started to breathe. When they applied electricity to the supraorbital nerve and heel, however, the most horrible grimaces were exhibited. Rage, horror, despair, anguish, and ghastly smiles united their hideous expression in the murderer's face, surpassing far the wildest representations of fusilli. In fact, this horrified spectators so much that many left in disgust, throwing up or even fainting. Er's experiments might seem rather frivolous today, but he effectively invented the defibrillators that are still used around the world to jolt cardiac arrest patients back to life. On the basis of his experiments, he rightly claimed that instead of direct stimulation, two moistened brass knobs connected to a battery and placed against the skin over the phrenic nerve and diaphragm could restore life to the clinically dead. Number 5. Andrew Cross, 1784-1855 
Fingering around on his inherited estate in the countryside, Andrew Cross was, unlike most on this list, an amateur scientist as opposed to a respected professor. However, his eccentrically obsessive fascination with electricity more than earns him a place in this video. Indeed, Mary Shirley once attended one of his lectures and was undoubtedly impressed by his work. To his country bumpkin neighbors, meanwhile, Cross became known as the Wizard of Quantox, or the Thunder and Lightning Man for wiring up his grounds in such a way that during thunderstorms his music room would come alive with fiery sparks and loud crashing noises. According to one local, it was actually dangerous to go anywhere near his house at night because of the devils all surrounded by lightning dancing on the wires. Cross himself saw electricity as a kind of mystical force, a divine creative power that could be harnessed by man. He is best known, perhaps, for apparently creating spontaneous organic life in the lab. It wasn't deliberate, though. It actually been attempting to generate crystals by passing electrical current through a piece of volcanic stone submerged in acid, but was astounded to see little mites emerging and wriggling their legs after 28 days as white bumps. Although he was just as mystified by this as anyone else, including other scientists who managed to replicate his results, Cross was denounced as a blasphemer and inundated with death threats. Naturally, the publication of Frankenstein only made things much worse. And as if knocking God off his pedestal wasn't enough, local farmers complained that the mites, which Cross named Acarus crossili after himself, were running amok and blighting their crops. In all likelihood, as Cross himself suggested, his apparatus was merely contaminated with eggs. Number 4. Sergei Brakonyeko Sergei Brakonyeko stepped things up a notch on the Frankenstein front by demonstrating that organs could be kept alive and actually functioning even after their removal from the body. He was able to do this by circulating oxygenated blood, as well as air when necessary, to keep the lungs breathing, as well as hearts beating, and even brains semi-cognizant. When he hooked a severed dog's head to his autojector pump, for instance, it reacted to external stimuli just as though it were living. It blinked when its eyes were prodded, licked its lips when citric acid was applied, and prickled its ears to loud noises nearby. Organs hooked up in this way only stopped working when the blood in the autojector coagulated after 100 minutes or so due to it not being hermetically sealed. When rumors of this mad communist scientist resurrecting the dead reached America, Brokonyeko became a sensation. The implications were huge. As George Bernard Shaw remarked when he heard the news, he'd happily have his head removed and kept artificially alive if it meant he could go on working without getting ill. Obviously, it wasn't that simple. While Sergei did experiment on humans next, he wasn't all that pleased with the results. Having sourced a fresh, relatively unscathed corpse from a man who'd hanged himself three hours earlier, Brokonyeko had hooked up a vein and an artery to the autojector and waited for the blood to reoxygenate. Within hours, he and his assistants had detected a heartbeat. But but then there came a terrifying gargling sound or death rattle from the throat, and the eyes snapped open, staring at the surgeons and scaring them all so much that they stopped the autojector and let the corpse rest in peace. Number three, Robert E. Cornish, 1903 to 1963. American mad scientist Robert Cornish was so confident in his ability to bring back the dead that he actually suffocated dogs in order to resuscitate them. This initially involved rocking them back and forth on a teeterboard to get the blood flowing, and unfortunately, it rarely worked. And even when it did, the dogs, all named Lazarus, wound up with brain damage. Eventually, in response to bad press, Cornish was fired from his position at UCLA. However, he continued his experiments at his home. He even played himself in a movie about his work and in 1947 petitioned the state of California for permission to resurrect a death row inmate. The condemned man, who'd been sentenced to death in a gas chamber for kidnapping and murdering a 14-year-old girl, had actually volunteered his own body to Cornish, but their request was ultimately denied. According to the state, it would be far too dangerous to allow Cornish access to the body before venting the gas chamber, and since this could take up to an hour, the body would be useless to the doctor. According to lawyers, however, the state was likely more concerned that Cornish might actually succeed. After all, if the murderer was brought back to life, having served out his death sentence in full, they would have no choice but to let him walk free. Number 2. Vladimir Demikov from 1916 to 1998 So far on this list, we've been missing a vital Frankensteinian trope, the mixing and matching of body parts. So here in our story enters Vladimir Demikov, who in 1959 was featured in Life magazine for creating a two-headed dog. To do so, he and his team got a hold of two healthy but apparently unloved specimens, a big dog and a small dog, 
random dog catchers. They cut the large dog's neck to expose the jugular, aorta, and part of the spinal column. They then prepared the smaller dog by tying off the main blood vessels and severing the spinal column while keeping both the head and forepaws intact and connected to the heart and lungs. Finally, they connected the blood vessels of the smaller, now partial dog to the corresponding blood vessels of the larger dog, and voila. Remarkably, the experiment was a success. Both dogs survived the procedure and were able to see and move independently. The fact that they died just four days later should not detract in any way from Demikhov's horrible achievement. His work contributed a great deal to the development of life-saving heart surgery and organ transplantation. Indeed, Christian Nietherling Barnard, the first surgeon to successfully transplant a heart from one human to another, credited Demikhov with having pioneered the field. Number 1. Robert J. White from 1926 to 2010 Demikhov also inspired the neurosurgeon Robert White to carry out head transplants on live monkeys, although as an observant Catholic and believer in the brain as the seat of the soul, White preferred to call this procedure a full body transplant. After attaching the entire head of one monkey to the decapitated body of another, with all of the nerves intact, White found the animal could see, hear, taste, and smell. He hoped this might one day be translatable to humans, potentially helping patients with multiple organ failure or terminal illnesses to turn their ailing bodies in for fresh replacements. But even one of White's own colleagues believed he was being naive. There were, for example, serious ethical concerns. Although the monkey survived the procedure, it looked confused and panicked, not to mention in pain when it woke up. White had little time for animal welfare when it came to the advancement of science and vehemently opposed organizations like Peter standing in his way, but his colleague undeniably had a point when it came to humans. After all, whatever Catholics might say about the brain being the seat of the soul, human identity is inextricably linked to our bodies. Can we essentially just stick a head from one person onto the body of another and say that they are the same person as before? Nevertheless, White defended his work by pointing out that every new development in the Frankensteinian history of organ transplantation has been met with serious controversy. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein itself is a fine example of just this kind of soul-searching at the nexus of science and morality. And if Sergio Canavero is to be believed, if we really are on the verge of human head transplantation, then Shelley's classic tale is about to become more relevant than ever. So I really hope you enjoyed that video, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every single day. Also, I've got a podcast, and it's called Brain Food. It's got educational, entertaining content just like this. It's a bit longer form and goes into a lot of depth on a specific subject, getting into all of the fascinating little details. You can check it out through the link in the description below, or just search your favorite podcast app for Brain Food. If you like this YouTube channel, you are sure to love that podcast. But if you're looking for something else to watch right now, why not check out a related video? video from the Top 10's archives over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.